if we look at the most recent guidelines from the American Heart, American Stroke Association published in 2014 in regards to antithrombotic therapy uh, for non-cardioembolic stroke or TIA, there are basically three drugs that are uh, recommended to be used. Aspirin, aspirin and extended release dipritamol in combination, and clopidogrel. And all of them are acceptable options uh, with really no clear-cut evidence uh, that one is superior to the other. Uh, as I said, I'm not going to really spend a lot of time on antiplatelet therapy because um, the data is, is really pretty old. And um, I think most of you are familiar with uh, the three antiplatelet agents. Uh, what I would like to mention is the results of the CHANCE trial, uh, which was a large uh, trial done in China, published uh, several years ago now, uh, that looked at the, uh, the combination of clopidogrel aspirin, uh, which was used for 21 days, and then that was followed up until day 90 by clopidogrel alone, and the control group uh, received aspirin during the entire 90-day uh, time period. Uh, I should also mention that on, the, on, the, on day one, the uh, patients uh, receive a loading dose of clopidogrel with 300 milligrams. Uh, and the patients that were included were TIA and minor stroke. Uh, the primary outcome uh, that was looked at in the trial was uh, recurrent stroke. And what you can see on the slide is that um, the, um, the survival free of recurrent stroke was significantly better with a combination of clopidogrel aspirin during that 90-day time period than aspirin alone. As far as safety, uh, there was really no difference uh, in um, severe bleeding between the two groups and a uh, small difference uh, in uh, more mild bleeding with the combination uh, therapy. So that's all I really want to say about antiplatelet therapy. Uh, there is a, uh, obviously the chance trial was done in Chinese people uh, only. So we really don't have any um, data currently for this uh, early treatment strategy um, in other populations. There's a big trial in the United States called the POINT trial, uh, which is continuing to randomize people. And this is comparing the combination clopidogrel aspirin to, to aspirin. Uh, over 90 days in high-risk uh, patients with minor stroke and TIA. Uh, this trial has been going on for quite a while, and unfortunately, we don't have the results yet, and hopefully we'll have them soon. Uh, what I'd like to move on to now is atrial fibrillation-related stroke. Um, and um, we know that warfarin is highly effective in reducing the risk of um, both primary uh, stroke occurrence and secondary stroke prevention uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation uh, and um, uh, either prior stroke or uh, people who are on the higher risk end with atrial fibrillation using uh, risk stratification scores such as the CHAD score or the chads vas score. And you can see here that warfarin versus placebo uh, reduce the risk of secondary and primary stroke by about two-thirds. Warfarin has been around for a long time, and it's a drug that many of us are familiar with, uh, but it's not an easy drug to use. Um, in the trials, the annual risk of intracerebral hemorrhage with warfarin was about 1%. Um, the risk of major bleeding side effects in real-life practice with warfarin, uh, even, even when it's well uh, controlled and, and monitors, monitors, is about two to three percent. Uh, and then there are a number of limitations. Uh, there's a narrow therapeutic window with an INR target of two to three. You have to have routine coagulation monitoring 
uh, of the INR uh, to adjust dosing. Uh, and uh, this is more frequent initially uh, and um, uh, becomes less, less, excuse me, less frequent over time. But this may be a real problem in underdeveloped countries uh, to get the patients back to, to do the monitoring. There's slow onset and offset, frequent dose adjustments, numerous food and drug interactions. So the patients have to be careful about what they eat and what other drugs they take. Uh, and uh, there's a thing called warfarin resistance where patients um, are rapid metabolizers of the drug and, and they don't easily get into the therapeutic range. So it's, it's far from an ideal drug. Uh, and um, this has led to the development of what we call the newer anticoagulants. Uh, um, they were called NOACs, uh, but now they're called DOACs, which stands for direct oral anticoagulants. Uh, so we have three drugs, apixaban, adoxaban, and rivaloxaban that are factor 10A inhibitors, and an, another drug, dabigatran, uh, which uh, is a direct thrombin inhibitor. And all four of these drugs have been approved in the U.S. and many other countries now for secondary stroke uh, prevention and uh, primary stroke prevention. So what I'd like to do is to um, go over some of the data of these newer drugs. Uh, they may or may not be available in the countries that you practice in currently, but I suspect that they will be available if they aren't already uh, not too long from now. So some of the advantages of the newer agents are that there's a fixed dose. So basically it's like using an antiplatelet drug. Uh, you just start them on a dose and uh, you don't have to adjust it like you do for warfarin. Now there, is, there are lower doses available uh, for several of these uh, that are used in patients um, with um, uh, some degree of, of re reduced creatinine clearance indicative of renal compromise. You don't have to monitor, there's no dietary restrictions, there's rapid onset and offset, and fewer drug interactions uh, than with warfarin. So some of the disadvantages are um, the rapid onset and offset, because you know, obviously it doesn't maintain its activity uh, that for that long. And for all, for all of them beside rivaroxaban, you have to dose twice a day. Uh, and compliance obviously may go down with twice a day dosing versus um, once a day dosing. Um, there's no readily available blood test to indicate um, uh, if the patient is on treatment and the anticoagulant effect. There are tests that can monitor the effects of the drugs, but they're not available even in many places in the United States uh, readily. So there's a thing called the Ecotrin. Uh, uh, coagulation time and the, and the um, thrombin time, but they're not available. Uh, there are now, uh, uh, there is an effective reversal agent that's been approved uh, in the U.S. for dabigatran, uh, the direct thrombin inhibitor. And agents are being developed for the uh, factor 10A inhibitors. In fact, there was a paper recently about a drug called Adonexat in the New England Journal, and one of the concerns about that reversal agent was the high risk for th uh, thrombotic events. And then obviously cost is a big concern. So in the United States, um, the newer drugs are six times more expensive than warfarin is on average. Uh, so it may not be something that you can use in developing countries because it's just too expensive. Uh, so I wanna go over the first three drugs that were approved. Uh, and then we'll mention briefly a doxaban uh, as we go through this. So um, the, th the first drug that was approved was dabigatran, the second was rivaloxaban, the third was apixaban. Uh, you can see uh, the information about time to peak concentration, the half-life, uh, the metabolism. Uh, uh, dabigatran is mainly renally excreted while the other two are fecally excreted, uh, excreted with um, uh, liver metabolism. And then you can see some of the drugs um, that can have effects on their metabolism. 